Good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming here tonight to enjoy an evening with author and social justice leader, Sister Helen Prejean. I'm San Francisco Public Defender Jeff Adachi, and I'm so pleased to be here tonight to welcome Sister Helen to our city. The Public Defender's Office provides legal representation to over 20,000 people each year. It's our responsibility to ensure that our clients receive the best possible representation. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the United States Supreme Court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright. That decision said that every poor person charged with a crime has a right to a lawyer. Still, public defender offices throughout the country don't have adequate resources in order to meet this basic right. We wanted to bring Sister Helen to San Francisco because she has dedicated her life to ensuring that poor people receive justice. She understands that poor people are more likely to be arrested for a crime, to be wrongfully convicted, and to be charged and sentenced to the death penalty. For over 30 years, Sister Helen has worked to abolish the death penalty, and she is the movement's most impassioned leader. She's an inspiration to me personally and to millions of people throughout the world. This event would not be possible without the leadership of Temple Emmanuel, who graciously agreed to host this event at this beautiful sanctuary. I would also like to congratulate and thank uh, Rabbi Stephen Pierce on his retirement after 20 years of serving this community. I know he's gonna be missed very much, but he'll continue to serve our city as Rabbi Emeritus in the future. I would like to recognize the sponsors who provided support for tonight's event. The law firm of Rosen, Bean, Galvin, and Grunfeld, Maria Mendoza Miranda, Dorothy Bischoff, and Jim Bustamante. Tonight's event would not have been possible without their support, so let's give them a big round of applause. I would also like to thank and recognize Armando Miranda, a deputy public defender in my office, who came up with the idea of inviting Sister Helen to speak. And it took over a year and a half because she's so busy. So he had to move heaven and earth to make it possible for her to be here. I'd also like to acknowledge the staff of the public defender's office um, and their families, our chief attorney, Matt Gonzalez, my wife, Mitsuko, and uh, daughter, Lauren. And I'd like to acknowledge all the volunteers uh, who made this event possible, including Tamara Apperton, Larry Roberts, Amy Bevan, and Veronica Ramirez uh, for their hard work in making tonight possible. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, I want to acknowledge uh, public officials who are here uh, tonight. Uh, first of all, Sh uh, Sheriff uh, Ross uh, Mirakarimi, thank you very much for being here. San Francisco District Attorney Chief of Staff, Christine DeBerry. <laughs> Supervisor John Avalos, Supervisor Norman Yee. <laughs> and we have representatives from Supervisor Malia Cohen's office. Thank you for being here. I would like to uh, welcome and congratulate uh, the new public defender of Alameda County, uh, Brendan Wood, who was disappointed last month. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Greg Callahan, who is the national coordinator of the Dead Men Walking School Theater Project. This is a theater project that was created uh, to produce the play uh, that was uh, based on uh, Sister Helen's book. And also uh, Jake Hedgie, who's a composer of Dead Men Walking the Opera. Our first speaker, Rabbi Ryan Bauer, has served Congregation Emmanuel since 2005. He was ordained by the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institution of Religion in 2007. He oversees the community development here at the temple, meaning that he works to increase neighborhood involvement as well as the congregation here at the temple. He's a graduate of UC Berkeley, and he studied at the Hebrew University in Jeru uh, Jerusalem, where he headed a research project that focused on solving uh, or examining solutions to violence in Jewish and Palestinian schools. He has served as a chaplain intern at the UCLA Medical Center. He also ran a teen program uh, in Oakland uh, for many years. 
Uh, but in addition uh, to all of his, of his community work, I hear he's a really great surfer. So let's welcome uh, Rabbi Ryan Bauer, who's going to share a few words. I did not think surfing would get in there. <laughs> to begin, I just want to thank everyone for coming to Congregation Emmanuel tonight. I would like to thank the Archbishop, as well as Jeff Adachi and the Public Defender's Office for putting this all together, for George Gascon for coming and speaking tonight, and one of our congregants who wants to remain anonymous for really putting this together from ground zero. Now, there's one more person that I need to thank, but before I thank her, I need to frame where we are in the Jewish calendar. Now, one of the Jewish community's major holidays is Shavuot, and it's only a few days from now. On Shavuot, we celebrate when we receive the Torah at Mount Sinai, and it's at that point where we're given the instruction manual of how to push ethics into the world. Into the world. And in honor of this, Jewish communities all over the world study from dusk until dawn. In fact, Jews study all year long, challenging and debating and working to repair this broken world. Marilyn Vosavant, the woman with the highest recorded IQ in the history of the world, she once said, to acquire knowledge, one must study. But to acquire wisdom, one must observe. We are here tonight with Sister Prajan because while all of us can study about capital punishment, it is something wholly different to have observed it. Knowledge is one thing. Sister Prajan brings wisdom. My final thank you is for Sister Prajan. Thank you for being here. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for allowing over a thousand of us here tonight to sit at your feet and to learn. Thank you. For the past 10 years, San Francisco has elected a district attorney who have pledged not to seek the death penalty. District Attorney George Gascon, when he was elected in 2011, continued the policy of not seeking the death penalty here in San Francisco. For this reason, San Francisco truly is a model for the state and the rest of the nation in the not seeking the death penalty. Uh, District Attorney uh, Gascon is the city's former police chief. I think we all know that. And he also served as a chief in Mesa, Arizona. Now, he is, as far as we know, uh, the first police chief to become the district attorney, except on Law & Order. I think it happens on TV, but not in real life. Uh, last November, uh, he was one of uh, f uh, a few courageous district attorneys who stood up and campaigned for Prop 34, the state measure to repeal the death penalty. He's earned a reputation as a criminal justice reformer who uses evidence-based practices to lower crime. Now, although we are courtroom adversaries, we do work together to make San Francisco the safest big city in the United States. Please welcome District Attorney George Gascon. Thank you and good evening, everyone. And thank you, Jeff, uh, for putting this wonderful event together. It is true that while we're often adversaries in the courtroom, uh, the reality is that Jeff and I get along really well and we have a great relationship. In fact, we work out of the same gym. So usually around six o'clock in the morning, as we're kind of getting out of bed and rolling into the gym, uh, some of the guys there joke around that we're working out deals. Um, while we're trying to work out. Um, but it's a real pleasure uh, working with Jeff Adashi because Jeff, I believe, is a consummate professional. There are times that clearly we disagree. We're, we're in the opposite side of a particular argument. Uh, but the one thing that you can say about Jeff Adashi is he's truly committed uh, to the work that he does and to his clients. 
and that reflects very highly on the quality of work from his office. I also want to thank Temple Emanuel for, for making this event possible today, Rabbi. Um, it's very meaningful. This is really an important conversation, uh, and the fact that you are allowing us to use this wonderful, beautiful facility to host this event today is very meaningful, and it shows a great deal of leadership as well. Um, sister, there is not enough I can say about your work. Uh, I think it's about 32 years now that you've been doing this stuff. I don't know how a 15-year-old can do all that. And <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's just uh, it, it's an inspiration to hear the, the commitment and the work that Sister Helen has been doing for so many years uh, in an area that, that uh, clearly is gaining momentum. But, you know, frankly, back in 1982, this really wasn't a popular thing to talk about, the abolishment of the death penalty. I would have to correct Jeff only in one, one area. I was the only district attorney that supported Prop 34 um, this last year. Um, and I, I will explain shortly why I did so. But I was also one of three of us that supported Prop 36. In fact, I was one of the state co-chairs and I run around the state. Uh, campaigning for Prop 36, and for those of you that may not remember what Prop 36 was, it was a reforming of the three strikes. And basically it was a, a shift moving away so that we would no longer put people in prison basically for life uh, for committing very minor crimes. Uh, I know it may be hard to believe for some of you, but we have people that were spending uh, life in prison for very minor offenses such as committing a shoplifting offense with some prior uh, uh, convictions. Uh, and that clearly was a miscarriage of justice. And I have to say that while Prop 34 failed, but quite frankly, very closely, especially if you consider how the shifting in the, the popular support for the abolishment of death penalty is moving, and it's moving so quickly. But Prop 36, on the other hand, passed uh, by over 2 thirds. And that was very significant, because it wasn't too many, too many years ago uh, when the people in California still were strong supporters of incarceration uh, at the levels that we have been. So I really believe that we are at a juncture in our criminal justice system, and I believe that increasingly people are becoming more knowledgeable about what works, what doesn't work, uh, and clearly high levels of incarceration for nonviolent offenders doesn't work, and obviously the death penalty does not work. And I'm going to tell you why I believe that the death penalty does not work. Besides any moral arguments that we want to make, the reality is that our system is not foolproof. The system makes mistakes. As a matter of fact, since 1973, there have been 130 individuals that were on death row that were later found to be not guilty. Just imagine for a second the heaviness of putting to death someone, and we later find out that this person was not guilty of that crime. Now, I know Sister is going to talk about her own experiences and her own dealing with people that are in death row and her own assessment of whether some of these people actually uh, were guilty or not of their crimes. But the reality is that we are human beings, as a human beings, we make mistakes, and we're subject to biases, we're subject to mistakes, and the death penalty is irreversible. And for that reason, and that reason alone, it should be abolished. But let me give you some other reasons why I also think the death penalty should be abolished. The whole purpose of the criminal justice system in a civilized society should be about keeping a community safe should be about lowering crime and making our communities a more livable place for all of us to be. It should never be about punishment. Unfortunately, I know that we sort of took a turn in California a little over two decades ago, and we decided we took the whole concept of rehabilitation away from our penal code and actually put punishment in there. But the reality that that is not the main purpose for our legal system and our criminal justice system. So if we move to an area that we're really talking about public safety, 
Another thing that I can tell you, and there's a lot of science behind this, so don't just simply take my word for it, the death penalty is not a deterrent. It does not make us safer. As a matter of fact, that you can talk to almost anyone that has committed a very serious crime, and they will tell you that at the moment that they were committing the crime, they were not necessarily thinking about what the punishment was going to be. That is just not normally the way the human beings work. And we know that when it comes to capital punishment, it does not deter anyone. So we're then doing this purely because we want to punish, because we're angry, because we basically want a pound of flesh. Well, so civil society, that's not a good place to be. And certainly, it's not good public policy. Let me tell you another reason why the death penalty is not a good thing. It's racial disparity. And again, I'm not going to talk a great deal about this because I know Sister has much, much better uh, experiences that she can talk about this. But I can tell you just nationally, if you look at the people that are in death, in death row or in this state, you will see that overwhelmingly they're going to be poor and they're going to be people of color. That by itself is another problem. And then finally, there's just a huge financial cost to this. We cannot afford it. We cannot afford it socially, as I indicated earlier. We cannot afford it economically. Therefore, that is why I'm here today. That's why I supported Prop 34. And that's what I look forward to working with all of you and many others that are not here today to see the day when California would no longer have the death penalty in the books. Thank you so much. It's a real honor being here today. Our next speaker, Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione, was named Archbishop of San Francisco on July 27, 2012, by Pope Benedict. He's from originally uh, San Diego, and he attended the uh, Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where he received uh, his doctorate in the canon law. He speaks four languages and worked directly under the Pope at the highest judicial body at the Vatican. Archbishop Cordiglione played an important role in last year's Prop 34 campaign, which would have replaced the death penalty with life without possibility of parole. As part of his effort, he personally sent out letters to each parish in the Archdiocese, urging a half a million Catholics to vote yes on the initiative. I learned that his family name means heart of a lion, and he certainly has earned that distinction in opposing the death penalty. Please welcome His Excellency, San Francisco Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione. Good evening. I just wish to repeat words of thanks that have already been spoken, but um, I want to express my own gratitude to um, our public defender, Jeff Adachi, and to uh, the staff here at uh, Temple Emmanuel for bringing uh, us together and for this very important event. And all of you who have uh, had a role in making this happen, thank you so very much. I think it's appropriate that I, as a Catholic Archbishop, speak tonight in this beautiful Jewish temple, this sacred place, which really is beautiful. <laughs> My first time here, I'm still relatively new in San Francisco, and I'm really, I'm awed by the beauty and sacredness of this place. But it's appropriate that I speak here in this sacred Jewish place about the dignity of all human life, because our Catholic faith has grown and evolved through a lot of different cultural expressions and experiences. But if you drill down, you see that we've never lost our Jewish roots. It is there in Jewish tradition and scripture that we Catholics find the source of our foundational belief in the dig dignity of every human person, this foundational belief that guides all of our thinking. And it's right there at the beginning in the book of Genesis, which informs us that God created the man and the woman in his own image and likeness, as the good book says. God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, 
he created them. As I said, this belief in the God-given dignity of every human person is a foundational principle for us Catholics, foundational for our moral theology, and it guides how we look at all social issues. It is why we advocate for respect for human life at all stages and in all conditions. And so that advocacy extends to the poor, the immigrant, the homeless, the hungry, and anyone on the margins of society. Now we know that capital punishment is a very contentious issue. And there are some who might say that those who are judged guilty of heinous crimes and condemned to death by the community are not a part of this spectrum of dignity. But while it is true that societies have the right to protect themselves from violence, the principle of legitimate self-defense applies here. As our uh, District Attorney Gascon was mentioning about, uh, was referencing this, and by the way, I want to throw in some word of thanks to you, our District Attorney. I didn't know that you were the only District Attorney in California to advocate for Prop 34. Thank you so very much. It's a great sign of hope to us. But the principle of, of self-defense means that one can exercise the minimum violence necessary to defend oneself against an unjust aggressor. We don't need to resort to killing for society to protect itself, certainly not anymore. Uh, our late Holy Father, uh, Pope John Paul II, mentioned this in uh, the encyclical letter he wrote on uh, the dignity of human life. He said there that uh, the nature and extent of the punishment must be carefully evaluated and decided upon and ought not to go to the extreme of executing the offender except in cases of absolute necessity. In other words, when it would not be possible otherwise to defend society. But then he goes on to say, today as a result of steady improvements in the organization of the penal system, such cases are very rare if not practically non-existent. I would say certainly for us in our society, it's non-existent. I don't have to review with all of you the so many reasons why the death penalty is not a good thing and our district attorney just did that for us anyway, but uh, there are so many reasons why it's not a good thing, especially because it disproportionately affects the poor and minorities and it just does not work as a deterrent. But at the heart of it is a principle that can be recognized by anyone willing to take note, to be an observer and gain wisdom. Anyone of whatever faith tradition or of no faith tradition, just if we observe, we can gain the wisdom and understand that violence begets violence. Rather than return violence for violence, we should make space for the mercy of God to touch the heart of the offender and leave open the possibility of his or her repentance of their crime and amendment of life, and even, maybe even, with the help of God, bring about a reconciliation with the loved ones of the victim. This is a principle, too, that we Christians get from our spiritual grandparents. As just one example, we read in the prophet Ezekiel, say unto them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. I think a lot of us are feeling no little frustration in the last election at the, defe the defeat of uh, the initiative to ban the death penalty here in California. I really thought the time was ripe for it, and I would thought California of all places would finally get around to uh, doing away with it. But as uh, our district attorney pointed out, it lost by only a narrow margin. And studies show that opposition to capital punishment is in fact growing. So we need to continue to educate, to advocate, and to pray. It is certainly an honor for us to have Sister Helen Prejean with us this evening. As you know, she has for years been a consistent and persistent voice in a society bent on vengeance against the death penalty. And you probably felt at times like you were a solitary voice, but we're behind you. <laughs> we're all in this together. Every just and good cause needs a prophet. 
Sister Prejean's prophetic voice has done much to make us aware of the fallacy of state-sanctioned killing. Let us then all become prophets this evening so that we too may be consistent and persistent advocates for life of the most forgotten and marginalized in our society. Thank you, Archbishop. Sister Helen Prejean was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. She joined the congregation at St. Joseph in 1957 and graduated from St. Mary's Dominican College in 1962. In 1973, she earned an MA in religious education from St. Paul's University in Canada. And she's been the religious education director at St. Francis Cabrini Paris and she taught me this. I thought New Orleans was two words, it's actually one. New Orleans, and so she says it. Uh, she served as a formation director for a religious community and she's taught uh, junior high and high school students in that capacity. In 1981, Sister Helen began her prison ministry after dedicating her life to the poor of New Orleans. She became the spiritual advisor to Patrick Saunier who was convicted of killing two teenagers and sentenced to die in the electric chair. She wrote about her friendship with the condemned man and about witnessing his execution. Her book, Dead Man Walking, an eyewitness account of the death penalty in the United States, was published in 1994. It was a bestseller and it was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for 31 weeks. It was an international bestseller. It's been translated in 10 languages throughout the world. In 1996, the book was developed into a major motion picture starring Susan Sarandon as uh, Sister Helen and Sean Penn as a death row inmate. It was nominated for four Oscars and Susan Sarandon won the Oscar for a portrayal of Sister Helen. The book also inspired an opera that was produced right here in San Francisco in 2000 by the San Francisco Opera and a play written by actor Tim Robbins. And the play has been performed now in 240 venues across the United States and the world. In 1998, Sister Helen was given the Pacaman Terrace Award named after a 1963 encyclical letter by Pope John XIII that calls on all people of goodwill to secure peace among all nations. For 30 years, Sister Helen has divided her time between educating citizens about the death penalty and counseling death row inmates. She's accompanied six prisoners to death row and counseled them. She's been instrumental in sparking a national dialogue about the death penalty and helping to shape the Catholic Church's opposition to state executions. Her second book, The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions, was published in 2004. Through the stories of two executed men, Sister Helen takes aim at wrongful convictions, explaining how flaws in the system inevitably lead to innocent people being put to death. Please give a warm San Francisco welcome to Sister Helen Prejean. Thank you. I don't know how long it was. Somebody was reminding me tonight. Maybe it's eight years ago, but on a Friday night, gave a talk here in this uh, synagogue and then went across the city to an Episcopalian cathedral. And so it was the only night in which I spanned both testaments, you know, being here and then going over to the, uh, to, to the cathedral. Uh, we are in a holy place. It is made holy, all of you gathered here around something so deep and so holy as the dignity of all life, even the guilty. 
Now, I'm from the South, as maybe y'all can tell. Uh, and we also have here at St. Benedict's community with us tonight, uh, those who are in the hearing impaired community. We are so happy and that you not only have a Southern accent here tonight, but we have translation for our deaf community so that they can be part of this. And we are very happy to have you here as well. <clears throat> I want to talk about fire. In the burning bush, in Exodus 3, Moses, who was doing pretty well, he was in Midian, he had murdered an Egyptian, so he was on the lamb, so to speak, and was taking care of Jethro, his father-in-law, things going well on the domestic front. I'm looking toward the rabbi here because I know you know about the story. This is your story, our story. And he sees a bush burning. I think his curiosity kind of did him in because he noticed that the bush was burning and that it didn't consume itself and it didn't go out. And he thought, how could a fire keep burning? And then, of course, he approached the bush and the voice and it's one of the first recorded voices in the scriptures of God revealing God's self to us. Take off your shoes, your sandals. This is holy ground. And the first revelation of the heart of God, I have heard the cry of my people. I want you to go to the Pharaoh and free the people. Martin Luther King, this was a very important, a very important message that he assimilated personally in his own life. The call, go liberate the people. I have heard their cry. In my own story, it took a while for me to hear the cry of the inner city of New Orleans because I lived in the suburbs and I came up in privilege. I had a wonderful mom and daddy and a Catholic family. Went to a Catholic school, excellent, St. Joseph Academy. I was a junior in high school and I learned public speaking. I learned how to write so that when I go to write a book, I know how to write, I know how to articulate, I know how to be an agent of change. Like one of my favorite schools here, you know, Mercy. Uh, here at Mercy of San Francisco, I've been in this school, and I see the women's leadership. Even the valedictory address was, we are nouns, not adjectives. We are verbs, not adverbs. Now, y'all may have to go back to your grammar a little bit, but that's women talking about leadership, right? Well, I had that at St. Joseph Academy. And so I become a nun, I'm a teacher, I love it. And I didn't get it about justice. I thought that it was about compassion and charity for people, that we should be kind to each other. And the poor, like Thanksgiving, you know, we always had drives and you, you brought stuff like candied yams and cans and peas and stuff and you give these baskets to the poor people. But I didn't understand about justice. And that is, we come to understand when God wakes us up. And God usually wakes us up through each other. There may be some people can go off to a cave and be unawake and come out and come out enlightened. But we, God always uses each of us to learn and to, to awaken. And that's why community is always going to be important and why gathering in community as we're doing it tonight is important. But the fire is, I woke up and I moved among African-American people in New Orleans who, when I was growing up, y'all could figure out maybe from some dates, that if I entered the community at 57, I was growing up in the 50s and the 40s. But it was during the days of Jim Crow and African-American people. I was never with African-American people. 
And the only way I even knew African American people was Ellen was, she worked in the house with mama and Jesse worked in the yard with daddy, keeping up things in the yard. I never even knew their last names. I never questioned the separation. Even Sacred Heart Church in Baton Rouge, black people had to sit way over to the right and couldn't mix with white people. And then when we make our first Holy Communion, which is, you know, the symbol of that we're all one in Christ, one body in Christ, black kids had to make their first Holy Communion separate from the white kids. And I never questioned it. And mom and daddy were real good and they were kind to all the individuals who worked for us. My daddy was a lawyer and he had a lot of clients that were, that were uh, African-American people and he was always fair and he was always kind. But I never questioned, that's what culture does. Culture says, that's the way we do things here. This is what we gotta do. This is, it's better for the races to be separate. And so when I woke up to the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus was about justice, that Jesus was on the side of the marginated, of those who were silenced, who didn't have a voice, those who were despised simply because of who they were or considered not human like the rest of us, like all the people on death row, like all those people in prison. Those people are monsters. Those people just soon kill you as look at you. We gotta have these prisons. And fear makes us lose our humanity because fear can make us do things that ordinarily we would never do. And I woke up and I heard a nun talk to us at Terre Haute, her name is Sister Marie Augusta Neal, and it's the beginning of the journey that I tell you about in Dead Man Walking. And when I moved in to the St. Thomas Housing Project and lived among African-American people, the sister who had begun Hope House in New Orleans, because people are always awake ahead of us. We're not the first one in the world to become awake. When you get there, there are always people awake ahead of you, right? And they, are, they become the teachers and the mentors, and Sister Lori was that for me. And so when I go move to Hope House, she said, now Helen, you don't have to have a blueprint in your back pocket about how you're going to end poverty. Just sit at the feet of the people and learn from them. And they are going to teach you just be neighbor to them. And I learned it was like being in a different country. All the rules were different. What happened to young men with the police? And then later when I did research, when I wrote Dead Man Walking, I found out there were more complaints to the Justice Department of police brutality in New Orleans than any other city in the United States. And as long as I was in the suburbs with people just like me, I didn't know there was police brutality going on in the inner city. Those weren't my people. I didn't know those people. And it's separation that kills us, separation from each other. We go, well, that's what those people do. And we look at them and we, t we turn a switch. It's a little click, not human like us. We gotta be scared of those people. And just transfer it over from all the people on death row, still 3,000 human beings in these small cells waiting 10, 15, 20 years to be killed, and transfer it right over to the, oh, those people are terrorists. We can't talk to those people. They don't understand that kind of language. We gotta fight fire with fire. We gotta go get the terrorists. The only thing to do is to kill the enemy. Find the enemy, dehumanize the enemy, and kill the enemy. And then we're going to be safe. But we just keep killing enemies. And the enemies keep sprouting up. And it forces us then to think deeper. How can we live in a world of restorative justice? How can we do the things that in a city lead to the violence? What's, what's the way to piece through justice for everybody? And let me tell you about fire. And I'm going to take you on the journey with me, but first I'm going to bring you to the end of the journey because it's the beginning of the book I'm writing now about my spiritual journey. It's called River of Fire. And it begins with fire, and it goes like this. And this is the execution of Patrick Sonier. It happened on April 5th, 1984, 
It's the first part of this book, the first person I'll talk about. And the way I have the prelude written for Journey for River Fire is this. They killed a man with fire one night. They strapped him in a wooden chair and pumped electricity through his body until he was dead. His killing was a legal act because he had killed. No religious leaders protested his killing that night. But I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. And what I saw set my soul on fire, a fire that burns in me still. And now come with me while I take you into what brought me into the killing chamber that night and the spiritual currents that drew me there. And the way God always works in us is through the power of attraction, through the power of drawing us. Duty, doing things for duty only lasts so long. Definitely backing into stuff and doing things out of guilt only lasts so long. There is one power in us where the fire does not die, and that is where we stay close to our heart's deepest desires and follow that desire. And so when I go to St. Thomas and begin to live among people there and see what was happening to people, if we had a plumbing problem, my daddy was on the phone the next day the plumber was there. And I'm seeing Miss Eva in public housing, 84 years old, in a wheelchair, having a leak in her bathroom, water on the floor. She had called public housing over a year, and they hadn't fixed the leak. And I see what it means to be poor and without agency. I also begin to see how the tenant association forms of people in St. Thomas, how you have to come together for your rights, how you have to stand up for them to make it happen. And the theology that I'd held on to for a long, long time, well, the poor suffer more, but one day they're going to be having a great reward in heaven, is that poverty is to be resisted. And Ignacio Ayacuria, one of the six Jesuits killed in El Salvador, said poverty exists, and there are reasons why it exists, because it is allowed to exist in society, because we have not become awakened enough and impassioned enough to resist poverty, to understand its causes, and to work for its abolition. Poverty has been allowed in this country from the beginning. And while we got a great constitution, we don't have a perfect constitution, and it was compromised from the beginning because we didn't even allow that slaves were citizens. We didn't allow women to vote. From the very beginning of our history, we have used violence to try to solve every social problem we encountered. So we killed the American Indians and put people on reservations. And I got friends in the Northern Cheyenne tribe, and I've been in a sweat lodge with them, and I've heard the stories how close they were that Church and Calvary were together. Church was saying, oh, these are pagan ceremonies. And so the Calvary then is coming and tearing down sweat lodges and stopping the peyote ceremonies because it was considered unholy. You're not holy the way we are. We're the ones who are holy. We have the truth. And I began to learn everything. I'm reading books. I'm reading the lives of the saints I was ready for that I'd never read before, like Martin Luther King, like Dorothy Day in the Catholic Church, who for years didn't become a Catholic because she saw Catholics only with the wealthy people. The communists were the only ones in New York associated with the poor, so she became a communist. (laughs) But now that I'm awake, and then I began to notice when I go back in the suburbs, try to tell people about people in St. Thomas, they go, why don't those people get jobs? Don't they know education is a big gateway? Why don't they keep their kids in school? Why don't they litter like they do? Why don't they take care of their property? Why don't they, 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 they? And I know Madeline, and I know Geraldine Johnson, and I know the families, and I know what's happening with the families. And I'm watching kids coming to the adult learning center that we had for high school dropouts. And here's a kid who was a junior in high school in one of the public schools, and we say, okay, look, what we're going to do, Willie, is we're just going to give you, let's see what your reading level is, see what your math level is. 
and then we're going to work with you individually. You were junior. You had one more year to go before you graduate. And he can't read a third grade reader. And I remember Father Robert Drynan, Jesuit, saying at a conference one time, it was not till the 60s that we allowed African Americans to attend any of our law schools. And so we have to understand how systemic things are, how racism works, it's systemic. So kids aren't growing up like I did with my daddy, ever seeing a professional or ever seeing an adult read a book. That's what you grow up with. And so how do we tackle this? How do we, those of us who are so privileged, who have been given everything, and we can't just walk around with middle class guilt. Guilt is a downer. <laughs> I don't know walking around with it for very long helps us, but it's how are we gonna use our precious energies to be involved in the works of justice. So look what happened to me. I'm working at Hope House. I'm coming, I'm on St. Andrew Street one day. I was walking down the street. Here comes a friend who worked in the Louisiana Coalition of Jails and Prisons. He has a clipboard. He has a little project going on. Anybody he saw that day, he's going to ask you to be, hey, you want to be part of this project? And the project was to be a pen pal to somebody on death row. And I thought, I didn't know much at all about the death penalty. Now, Daddy, when he talked about that legal stuff, you got to be motivated to want to talk about legal stuff. And I'd let it go, man, all that loyally talk, let it go, let it go, you know? But he said, hey, Sister Allen, you want to be a pen pal? And there was this man, Patrick Sonier. Y'all, it was the 1980s and early part. We had put the death penalty back in the Supreme Court in 76. I didn't know, know, even know they were going to kill this person. I thought I was only going to be, you know, like writing some letters. I don't know if y'all talk in the synagogue about the sneakiness of God, but there must be some prophets who've mentioned the sneakiness of God. I know Jeremiah said, you seduced me into this. It's stronger than sneaky, actually. Uh, so I wrote this man on death row. And you know what the problem was? He wrote back. Because <laughs> when there's a real personal encounter between people, we can hear about people forever, even look at videos or YouTube or whatever. But when we meet each other, that's where the fire is. It's where the encounter is. And you know they got this new kind of photography about lightning? Lightning doesn't just come down anywhere. They found with this new photography that whenever lightning hits, there's this little opposite current going up from a tree, from a rock, and the lightning connects with that little current. That's what happens with us. Each of us is a little current. So boy, lightning connected. I wrote a man, he wrote back, he had no one to visit him, and this is the journey in Dead Man Walk. And I go to visit him, he had no one. And I begin to learn everything about the death penalty. Two years later is that scene in the prelude from death, from River of Fire. They killed a man with fire one night. It was Patrick Sonier. I accompanied him for two years. And along the way, I met the heroes of the movement to abolish the death penalty, which is a lot of people, but in a very special way, public defenders. For the first time in my life, I was working alongside people who cared about human rights. And when I called this guy, Mildred Farmer, in Atlanta, who worked on capital defense, I thought as a nun I knew what dedication was. But when I, this team, team defense, Mildred Farmer, would drive all night coming from Atlanta to try to save this man's life and give him defense that he never got at trial. I learned the difference between what happens in the appeals courts and what happens at trial. And trial is an adversarial system of coming to truth. Prosecution presents, defense presents. And that's how the truth is supposed to come out in a perfect system. But when you're poor, and when your attorney is overworked and underpaid, 
You're supposed to be able to have a jury of your peers that's fair and impartial. You're supposed to get due process. You're supposed to be able to summon the eyewitnesses who can tell your story and prove that you're not guilty of what you're being charged with. Suppose, suppose, suppose. There's a whole bunch of constitutional protections you're supposed to have. And then real life happens. Over 95% of criminal cases or it's bargain basement. It's not even a trial with a jury. It's just let's plead a deal. Poor people get pled, even when they're innocent at times. I learn, I'm going to learn everything about this. And then it was his killing, though. It was his killing that where, it was where the fire happened. Because by then I had also met the victim's family. After making a terrible mistake, not reaching out to them, I didn't know what to do with the victims. I'm learning about this guy, I'm learning about the law, I'm learning about what the lawyers are doing, and I know that the state of Louisiana is not going to be one bit safer by killing this man. I'm accompanying him and all he's going through as a human being, taking responsibility and the remorse and the sorrow because two teenage kids had been killed. I don't know what to do with the victims, so I stayed away from them. And it was a terrible mistake. I mean, I didn't even write them a letter. Two beautiful teenage kids had been killed by Patrick Sonier and his brother. And when I read about it, when I went to the, got the files, looked into it, saw their faces in the newspaper, a boy, David LeBlanc, he was just 17, the only son, the family name died with David. And Loretta Borg, a beautiful young girl, just 18. And the parents had sent their prom picture into the little newspaper in South Louisiana, the Daily Iberian, New Iberia, Louisiana. And these kids are going to a football game on a Friday night. Every parent's worst nightmare. And the last time their parents saw them was in the kitchen. And David, standing by the sink, and his mom had gotten him a new long sleeve blue velour shirt, and he's rubbing the arms, saying, oh, mama, this is going to keep me warm tonight. And his daddy later says, yeah, but it couldn't keep him alive. And they go and park near this sugarcane field that had been harvested in a place dark away from any help. And here the two brothers, rabbit hunting out in the field, see the car and the kids' ultimate nightmare, too, because they, they see flashlights coming across the field, and then they see they have guns. And it's unspeakable what happened to them. And these two beautiful young people, just budding, just beginning life, are found dead, shot, execution style, their faces in the wet grass. And I happen to be with the man and his brother now that I'm also visiting, who did this? And when I realized what the crime was and what they had done, the ripple of guilt through me, like, what am I doing? Like, I'm with the people who've done this terrible crime. And I could see how the victim's family put you on a seesaw because what they're being offered by the state of Louisiana, now here's what we're going to do for you. We are going to, we hopefully are going to get the death penalty for both of those brothers, but it looks like we only got it for one of them. But what we're going to do for you is hopefully it won't be too long. In California, the average wait, I think, is around 20 years from going to death row to execution, and even then it might not happen. And what we're going to do for you now is, I hope the wait won't be too long, but we will summon you when we're ready to do justice which means we're going to kill the one who killed your loved one. We're going to let you watch from a witnessing chamber. You're going to get to send representatives, and that is going to make you whole again. That is going to heal you. That is going to give you closure. Or they put it simply, oh, we will get justice for you. And I don't know what happens to victims' families. All I could know was me and my sister Marianne has five children. If anybody killed young Helen, any of us, we can all go there. It's the place we all go if this happened to my child or my niece or my daughter or my mother. I know I would want to see that person die. And what most families say that I've known over these 20 years 
is I would like to kill him with my own hands. Everybody starts there. It's almost everybody who starts there. And we all, when we hear about these terrible murders, we go to that place of outrage. And you know what? I think outrage over the death of innocent people is ethical, to feel the outrage of the death, feel it. It's what we do with it. And so what happened with Pat, Pat Sonier, I met the victim's family at the worst possible time. I hadn't written them a note. I hadn't called. They, they didn't know anything that I knew or anything. And it was at the pardon board hearing, which cannot be more polarized. And actually in Louisiana, I don't know if y'all do this in California now, but when you're going into a pardon board hearing, five appointees from the governor, this is your last chance for a family, you know, for the person to plead for clemency. The witnesses, the, I mean, the victims' families are there with all their relatives, all their kin, all their friends, because they want to give a signal to that, those five people of the governor, don't you dare deprive us of our justice. It's the last legal loophole, that, loophole they got to jump through. So they're there with all their friends. And when you sign the book, you sign it literally if you're for life or death. And there were just three of us who were for Patrick Sonier for the pardon board to preserve his life. Everybody else in the room was there to see him die because they had been told, this is justice. You've had the ultimate loss of your child. We're going to seek the ultimate penalty for the one who did it because anything less than that, it will dishonor your dead child. That's the culture. That's the culture of violence. That's a culture saying the only way we can get justice is he killed your child, we kill him, and you get to watch. And that's when I met them. I met them outside the building while the pardon board was voting. It couldn't have been a worse time. And I had done it all wrong. I had a good editor. When I was working on this, I downplayed not reaching out to this victim's family. And he's looking at the first draft and he goes, well, Helen, you're kind of downplaying that. that. That was really a bad mistake. He said, uh, it was cowardice, wasn't it? Uh, you were scared, weren't you? I go, yeah. He said, look, put that in your book. When you write a book, don't just take people with you on the peaks of the waves where you do it all right. By the way, I've only worked with Jewish editors at Random House. Uh, and we, we've, done, we've done some good collaborative work, both of these, both of these books. Uh, and I met them, we were walking outside, the Borks who lost their daughter were furious at me. They just averted their gaze, walked past me, didn't say a word. Actually, they were very contained and respectful because they could have screamed, they could have done a lot. And right behind them was the father and mother of the boy who had been killed. And I expected the same anger, the same rejection, which I deserved. And the father, Lloyd LeBlanc, he walked right up to me with his wife. He said, Sister, our son, it was David who was killed. And Sister, all this time you've been visiting those two brothers and you didn't once come to see us. You can't believe the pressure we under with the death penalty. Everybody's saying to us, we got to be for the death penalty. He said, I even went to mass at different churches on Sunday to, to hear a priest just say something about the gospel of Jesus and are we supposed to forgive our enemies? I haven't had anybody, sister, where have you been? And I went, Mr. LeBlanc, I am so sorry. I didn't think you'd want to see me. It was so lame, so pitiful, so weak. And he said, sister, I go pray in this little chapel. Come pray with me. He said, sister, you need to come and you need to walk in our shoes and see where we've been as these victims' families. He was a teacher. He's the hero of this book. He's the one. He's the first one I ever met who took me there. And as he prayed that day, and it's a Catholic devotion, we prayed the rosary. Uh, before, in keeping vigil before the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist, Christ present in the Eucharist, from four to five in the morning. I mean, he, he, I said, sure, I'd love to come pray with you. Uh, when do you pray, Mr. LeBlanc? He goes, oh, four to five in the morning, Friday mornings over in St. Martinville and St. Martin at Tours Church. I go, oh, oh, well, uh, 
four to five, I'll be there. This is a Catholic thing you gotta understand, you know, and you keep vigil all through the night in adoration chapels. And then to kneel alongside that man. And see, when you pray the rosary, you're remembering the mysteries in the life of Christ and his mother. And it's all about his agony and his passion and his death. And I'm kneeling alongside a man who's praying through the agony and death of his only son. And he took me step by step into his heart and into his journey. He was the first victim's family I met who taught me that forgiveness is not first and foremost what you do to relieve the burden of the one who has hurt you. It's first and foremost of saving his own life. And here's how he put it. He said, sister, my whole life, I love to help people. I'm, I'm good with my hands. I can fix anything. You come to my house, you're gonna see lawnmowers and cars and, hey, Lloyd, would you fix this? And he said, but then everybody's saying to me, Lloyd, you got to be for the death penalty or it'll look like you didn't love David. So when you have a society that's offering you this kind of cultural symbol of, we're going to kill the one who killed your loved one, and you're not going for the ultimate penalty? Like, what's wrong with you? So he said, I went there. I did. You know, all those people saying that to me, I said, yeah, I'd like to see it. I'd like to pull the switch. I don't care how much their mother suffers. I want to do it. I want to see him die. I want to see them have a little bit of the pain that's been inflicted on my wife, Eula, and on Vicky, my daughter, and on all of us. And then he said, you know what, though? I didn't like what happened to me when I went there. And finally, I just, I kept praying. I kept asking Jesus, help me, help me. And then he said, uh-uh, they killed our son, but I'm not going to let them kill me because all that hatred and that bitterness, it was taking over me, and I was losing who I was. So he said, I'm going to do what Jesus said, and he set his face to go down the road of forgiveness. And Lloyd de Blanc was the first teacher, a man who entrusted this to me, that forgiveness is first and foremost a preserving through God's grace in us and through community around us of saving our own lives, of preserving integrity and love and not letting the love be overcome by the hatred or that we have to return in kind. You caused us pain, we're going to cause you pain and your whole family. I never had even thought about what would happen to a mother who lost her, whose child did a terrible thing. And Mrs. Sonia couldn't even go into the grocery in St. Martinville because she would overhear people saying, loud enough for her to hear, there she is, that white trash woman. Her sons are the ones who killed the LeBlanc and the uh, Bork children. And people are cutting up dead animals and throwing them on her front porch. Like when we legalize the hatred that it's okay to kill this person, but it's like we can drop this big drop of red dye into a big bowl of water and say, but don't spread now, don't spread. We just want to get him. Like a laser beam of hatred to take out the wicked one from among us. But don't hurt his mama. As if we can do that. Lloyd de Blanc is the only one who extended kindness. He made his own journey and stayed on it, too. He's the last one written about in this book. Forgiveness was never going to be easy. Each day it must be prayed for and struggled for and won. But one day she hears somebody on her front porch, looks through the blinds, and sees there's a man standing there. And she opens the door, and it's Lloyd de Blanc, and he has a basket of fruit. And he said, Miss Sonia, I know you're having a tough time in this town. He said, here, this is for you. And I'm a parent like you. As parents, we never really know what our kids might do. If you need me, you call me. And those are the witnesses we have in our society who are standing up more and more. When New Jersey did away with the death penalty four years ago, 62 murder victims' families testified saying, don't kill for us. And it, it is their witnesses, their, their witness that are helping us as a nation. And witnesses from all over, 
DAs who say, this doesn't help anybody. Law enforcement people say, you know, helping people to understand the only way to do is not to imitate the crime. Where else in the criminal justice system do we ever let the behavior of the criminal determine how we're going to act? And when I came out of that execution chamber after Cap Patrick was killed, I had never in my life experienced anything like this before. My life had been cushioned, and it was about, you know, helping people through squabbles or stuff. But man, nothing like this. And then to be there in the protocol of death, when we were doing the film, Dead Man Walking and Susan Sran, I mean, I was there with them, and we, we went through this together. She said, this is so surreal because you have the guard watching him 24 hours a day to make sure he doesn't commit suicide and deprive the state of taking his life. Oklahoma, this guy had a, a heart attack three weeks before the execution. They bring him to the hospital, get his heart back, bring him back so they can kill him. Same place, Oklahoma, another guy got a hold of pills, took an overdose, bring him to the hospital, pump his stomach out, get him good, because so we can kill him. And what's going on here? And it's that protocol of death. And then I began to realize, and there's stories in here too, what happens to the guards who have to do the killing for us? You know, good ordinary guys will guys your job tonight is we've got to take that guy out of that cell, and they're going to practice for this. In Louisiana, they have a practice. They get a guard of the same height, same weight as the one to be executed, and they do a dry run. And they do it when the person goes peacefully, and they do it where he fights them every inch of the way, saying, don't kill me. They got to be able to do it. What happens to them who do the killing for us? And their stories are beginning to come out. Newsweek had a two-page spread within the last year called I Committed Murder. And it's the lead-off story is Jerry Givens, who talked about killing 62 people in Virginia as the state's executioner, 62. And he said, I'll be honest with you, in the beginning, I had what you call an executioner's high, because I knew some of them had killed a child or they'd killed an elderly couple, and I was the one. I was the one to pull the switch. I was the one to inject the poison. And more I felt high afterwards. Well, we got him. But he said we just kept killing people. And, he, and then he began to question some of them. He thought maybe they might be innocent. And they're saying, Jerry, we can't get into that, Jerry. The courts take care of that. Don't go there, Jerry. Just do your job, Jerry. Just do your job. And he's the one that gave the article the, the, the title. And finally, when he was talking about it, he just said, I know I committed murder. It was all legal, but I know I committed murder. And you know, when, the closer you get to this thing and see it, there's a death certificate after somebody's executed. Guess what they put on there for cause of death? What are you going to write? Failure to breathe? <laughs> Heart attack? You got to write it. it to, truth has to say its name on the death certificate. Cause of death? Homicide. A human being killing another human being. Now, Texas puts legal in front of it, legal, uh, homicide by way of lawful execution. But it's human beings. And what happens to them? And we are removed from it. And what happened is I came out of that execution chamber that night, in the middle of the night, threw up. I'd never witnessed a human being whom I knew, whom I had accompanied. I knew the story of his soul. I have his Bible. I have the Psalms underlined. Oh, God, they plot to take my life, but you are my rock. On you I stand. Oh, God, be merciful to me. And they killed him. And I remember thinking there in the dark, really, my mission was born. It's why I'm standing before you tonight. And it's also the source of the energy and passion that I know, because that's been given to me because of what my eyes have seen. The American people are never going to get close to this. They're never going to see it. It's a secret ritual done behind prison walls. You are never going to be close to it. 
but I had been brought in as a witness, so I had to tell the story, and so I began. And the journey then continued, and I continued to accompany people, and that's the source of the fire, is the presence with people on death row and the suffering that continues to go on. As we begin to delve more and more into human rights, and when we begin to take seriously that we have signed on to the UN Convention Against Torture, which is an extreme mental or physical assault on someone who's been rendered defenseless, we are going to shoulder this thing that the death penalty is, in fact, the practice of torture. Dobie Gillis Williams, whose story is the first one in this book, was brought into the death house three times before he was killed. Torture, extreme mental assault. Okay, Dobie, this is it. We take you near the death house. Okay, Dobie, say goodbye to your mama. Say goodbye to your family. Okay, Dobie, we're coming close now. It's going to be like in an hour. Here's your last meal. What would you like to eat? And then we're going to come for you when it's time. You okay, Dobie? Some, I mean, there's a kind of kindness of the guards there who are brought into doing this. Dobie, you doing okay? Uh, Dobie, you need a Valium anything? It's not that they're all mean and like, ha, 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 you're going to die. They're caught in this thing, too. And Dobie was brought in the death house three times before they killed him. He got within an hour and a half of death twice. And he got a stay of execution while they looked at another legal aspect, brought in again. Oh, Dobie, uh, uh, you got a stay, brought in the third time. And he said, Sister Helen, I need it to be over. I can't keep doing this. One day, and the discussion begins now, because human rights, human rights and the dignity of, of human life is all tied together. And Pope John XXIII, who wrote Pacem in Terrace in 1963, pointed for us toward the UN Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and said that is going to be our beacon for the future. And Article 3 and Article 5, Article 3, everyone's got the right to life. Article 5, no one should be subjected to cruel and degrading punishment or torture. And I haven't been wrong about the American public because I remember thinking, it's just that people don't know. They don't reflect on the death penalty. That's not one of the moral issues most people have to deal with personally or give a lot of reflection to. So I got to tell the story. In the beginning, we talked about pitiful little bitty audiences. We're talking about St. Christopher's nursing home after lunch. <laughs> and the announcement, anybody wants to hear the death penalty nun, go to parlor A. <laughs> and it is three people stumbling into parlor A. And so I'm starting to tell the story, and within 10 minutes, two of them were gone, 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 man. They weren't snoring, but they definitely weren't conscious. And this one lady was listening, and I hear my eyes locked with that lady, like, lady, don't leave me. Like, you're it. You're it. But then you tell the story, and you learn how to bring people over to both sides, to the victims. Okay, let's go with the victim's family. Let's go with Vernon Harvey, who's the second story, his daughter, I mean, his beautiful daughter, terribly, awfully, unspeakably killed, and he couldn't wait for the execution of Robert Lee Willie. And he and his wife Elizabeth had their own press conferences, and he's saying, I want to pull the switch, I can't wait. And so he's there. And I tell him, the story's here. And he witnesses him being killed in the electric chair, comes out afterwards, all the media was there. How you feel now, Mr. Harvey? You got to watch Robert Willie die. He said, yeah. Anybody got any whiskey? Anybody want to dance? We got the SOB tonight. And then he added, you know what? He died too quick. I hope he goes to hell. Hope he burns it now. No matter how many times he watched Robert die, he went home, the chair was just as empty. Where his daughter Faith once sat, there was no restoring that life. And then what happens to him? And I just want to say one other thing about this book. And I want to invite you to read these books because when you read them, it's kind of like a retreat. You're quiet. You're not debating. 
and it's intimate because you're using your own imagination to go to those places. And you're also getting information. I didn't know anything about this thing, but I learned along the way. And I invite you then to come with me on the journey with me. We can learn together. And I take you there. And I'm inviting you to read the books because we know this. Thurgood Marshall, first African American on the Supreme Court, said the American people say they support the death penalty. Educate the American people, and they're going to reject the death penalty. And that is what has been going on in this country. That is what we must do. And educate and activate. Because if we don't act, no matter, oh, wasn't that a fine talk we heard there in the synagogue? Boy, those Jews are really getting it together here. I mean, you know, and they had the Catholics in there. We all heard a great talks and all. And then we go on. And it's a vulnerable place to be when our consciousness is changed and we become aware of something. And then if we don't act, there's, there's a danger of a kind of moral paralysis in us. But the minute we begin to act, the minute we put our hand to the rope and we join with a group of people in California that almost got Prop 34. Elizabeth Zittrin sitting right here tonight. She's scared, as, I mean, tired as I'll get out because she just got from, back from Taiwan where she works in, with a world group to end the death penalty. We came so close. And didn't you say, Elizabeth, if we'd had $2 million more million to get a few more TV spots in, we'd have done it. Yes. But look how the consciousness of people changes. So to be educated. I mean, Lauren, what's your name, Adachi? Is your daughter Lauren? Are you with me? <laughs> Jeff, are you awake? Lauren, who's sitting right here, who's 12 years old, did a video, a teaching video on the death penalty that blew me away when I saw it last night. The kid got the information, she got the arguments, accurate information about the death penalty and raising moral questions to us. Lauren, check out our video. You can put it on YouTube or do something to get it out to people. And the same can happen to us. I just want to say one word, and this book is also the journey with my Catholic church on the death penalty. And in the past, the, the polls and opinion polls weren't real promising, but we knew that. We knew that people weren't thinking about this issue much. But in 1996, in the United States, among Ab Americans, support for the death penalty was 78%. Among Catholics, it was 80%. And now in 2005, and I got to get the latest, but you've seen a precipitous decline. Among Americans now, it's about 62%. Among Catholics, it's 59%. And among young Catholics, 30 and younger, over 60% are against the death penalty. Now, how did that happen? It's the way moral evolution in a society always happens. We talk to each other, we educate each other, and we help each other to see, and then we make the changes that are necessary. In this is a man's story called Joseph Odell in Virginia. Virginia killed Joseph Odell in July 1997, didn't blink an eye. Virginia is the second beyond, only other than Texas that kills the most people. The Deep South do 80% of the executions in this country. And if we had a Supreme Court that would read what is on the frontispiece of the Supreme Court, equal justice under law, and look at the disparity of practice where supposedly we have a rudder where we're going to decide only the worst of the worst get the death penalty, and 80% of the executions, who are the real practitioners? The 10 southern states that practice slavery. Where you really see racism is in the victims when white people would kill or killed is when the overwhelming majority of the death penalties are sought. When people of color are killed in this country, it is such a scandal. It's barely a blip on the, on the radar screen. If a life is negligible, a death 
is negligible. And if there's no passion about the quality of the person's life, their death is never going to be a source for us of passion or outrage. Some people are just more disposable than others in this society, comes right with poverty. But the Catholic Church got involved in this discussion, and not just me, it's always with all the people. When you see a, a pot boil, there's a lot of little bubbles, they start at the bottom. You never just have one big fat bubble called dialogue. It's all the little bubbles. But I did get to have a direct dialogue with Pope John Paul through Joseph Fidel, who was executed. Italy buried him. They transported his body over to Palermo and gave him a ceremonial burial because they said, we are not going to let you be buried in Virginia soil because of the injustice done to you. And that's how I got to have a direct dialogue with Pope John Paul. And I said, Your Holiness, does the Catholic Church only believe in the dignity of innocent life. And I'm all for the dignity of innocent life, all life. But when I'm walking with a man to execution, and I was thinking of Patrick who said this, and he's shackled hand and foot, he's been rendered defense, completely defenseless, and he says, Sister, please pray God holds up my legs as I make this walk. Where is the dignity in this death? Can you help the Catholic Church firm up its opposition to the death penalty so that we can become a force for action with legislatures and across this country? And I'll let you read the details of it in the book. But he did it. And when he came to St. Louis in 99, he had been in the United States four other times. And Catholics need to hear from leaders. Catholics need to hear strong, any, any, like we need strong rabbis to stand up, we need strong bishops to stand up, we need strong people to stand up. But it's always a community together in dialogue. And then when Pope John Paul came to St. Louis in 99, for the first time, we heard coming out of the mouth of our leader. He said no to abortion, no to euthanasia, no to physician-assisted suicide and no to the death penalty, which is cruel and unnecessary. He acknowledged the cruelty or torture of the death penalty. Our court won't touch it yet, because the consciousness has got to grow in us, and the court follows the people, okay? And he said, even those among us who have done a terrible crime have a dignity that should not be taken from them. And that's where we are. It's all about us. You know the best definition of justice? The working definition of justice? It's just us. Just us. <laughs> and when we wake up, then we want to get a hold of that rope. And I want to, you have invitations waiting for you out there. One of them is the play of Dead Man Walking. Tim Robbins is the only playwright I know of who wrote a play so the young people of the country can do it. It's not for commercial production on Broadway. It's for universities and for high schools. And you have two departments that have to pick up the issue of the death penalty. So discourse starts going in the school. When Mercy of San Francisco did it, the whole curriculum. In chemistry, they're looking at the chemicals you use to kill people. In government and politics, you're looking at how the death penalty works. How does the criminal justice system work? In English, well, what books have been written on prison, or how do you, you know, how do you enter into the rhetoric of it, the debate of it, the whole thing? And I want to invite you to look into this. We have like 500 of these here tonight. Any high school you know, university where you, can, for the young people to be invited to do this play. Tim Robbins is proud of it because he said the young people are the bearers of the future in this country, and we got to wake them up. If we wake up the young people, we're going to go on, on, the, on the right track. And the death penalty, don't think it's a peripheral moral issue about what to do about a few criminals who've done terrible crime. All the deep wounds of our society are in the death penalty. Only the poor are selected for death. Our racism is in it overwhelmingly if you kill a white person is when you get the death penalty. 
And then it keeps sealing in us that the way to deal with social problems is violent solutions. And so we need to take a path of life. We need to be a life culture, a life society. And so I encourage you to dig, to read, so that our souls can catch on fire, so that we can work for justice. Any efforts to end the death penalty are going to pick up all of these issues. And I just have to say one little word about the arts. I believe there are three ways in society that we're educated or, or that, we, that we come to understand. One is education. The other is our religious communities, our faith communities, or our human rights communities. And the other is the arts. And in this very city, in the year 2000, the opera of Dead Man Walking premiered here. And it was the first opera company to do it. Jake Hagee's sitting in here. He was a composer of the music. He never did an opera before. Well, I never wrote a book before. Terrence McNally had never done a libretto before. They called it all virgin verse that happened around the opera, you know? <laughs> the book, well, some of them were going, well, they didn't want to use that image too much, but it's just like never did it before, it couldn't happen before, and here we are. And Jake, the, the uh, power in the opera is the turning point, is the mother of the death row inmate. Frederica von Stade did it here in San Francisco. And before then, I mean, you're all moving in the direction because you know he did it. You even witnessed it in the prologue that he killed two innocent young people. You, you witnessed the murder, so you start with the outrage. You know who did it. He won't take responsibility, so you want to see him get it even more. Bring it on. And then the turning point is when this mother comes up. She's never spoken in public before. And she goes, is this where I talk? I feel like I'm on TV or something. And then she pulls out her little notes that I helped her write. She goes, I'm just asking you not to kill my boy. I know he did a terrible thing, but please don't kill my boy. And all of a sudden, then things get very complex. And we hear the victims' families. And there's a, a medley when, when Jake got this in the opera. He called me on the phone. He's playing the piano in the background and said, Helen, I think we have the heart of the opera. And the victims' families are singing, you don't know what it's like to see your child go out the door. And the last thing you say is clean your room, do your homework. The last word you ever say, if you knew these were going to be the last words you ever said, you'd say how much you love him or her. And then while they're singing, Mrs. De Rocher, Joseph's mother, the death row guy, is thinking, you don't know what it's like to see your son slip through your fingers. And then one night, and then one night, he does this terrible thing, and everybody's singing the same pain. Art brings us on a journey. Belonging to a spiritual community brings us into deep parts of our souls we don't even know we have. And so it's such a privilege to be here tonight and to be here with these good public defenders and a DA. I mean, we don't have any DAs like you in Louisiana. I, I don't know, maybe you could teach an online course or something, but, uh, but a DA with integrity who knows that the purpose of a district attorney is to keep the community safe and to seek justice and not get caught like the Green Bay Packers with your team and we got to win no matter what, which is what happens to people who are only human beings and we human beings don't do well with pressure. Thank you. Thank you. You have inspired us in, in so many ways just by your presence here and your gospel. Thank you. We do have a special uh, presentation. I would uh, ask uh, Lauren uh, to come up and also Armando.
Hi, my name is Lauren. On behalf of San Francisco and the Public Defender's Office, I'd like to present Sister Helen with this special pen. Wow. Mm. This pen is inscribed with a Latin phrase that means, let justice be done even though the heavens may fall. Thank you so much, Sister Helen, and let's abolish the death penalty. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, well, Sister Helen. No, uh, I'll be glad to sign books for him. Yeah. Oh, you got I, I would like uh, Armando Miranda uh, to come up. <laughs> I think he's being very shy. Anyways, we would like to, uh, again, uh, thank you so much uh, for coming here uh, to San Francisco and present you. Uh, with this bouquet of flowers. And I just want to mention um, that uh, after... Look at all these notes you got. <laughs> You're a true lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> um, just a, a few announcements. That uh, we are going to have the uh, book available uh, in the uh, foyer of the main sanctuary. As you walk out the door, uh, the book sales will be on the table to your right, and the signings will be on the table to your left. Uh, the books are $20, and 100% of the proceeds go to Sister Helen's uh, charity, uh, the Sisters of St. Joseph. Um, also, uh, you can donate uh, to support Sister Helen's work. Uh, there is a donation box uh, for the Sisters of St. Joseph's if you wish to make a contribution. Also, you can find out how you can help abolish the death penalty. There's a form that we'll be handing out, and it uh, will connect you uh, with the National Coalition uh, to Abolish the Death Penalty in Washington, D.C. You can fill it out, and they will add you to their uh, email list. Uh, finally, uh, we'd ask you just to uh, please stay seated while uh, Sister uh, Helen exits. She's exiting the back. Uh, makes your way to the book signing table. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you to all of our speakers uh, tonight and all of you uh, for being here. Good night.